Argentina, at least. Okay, so it is a pleasure to have here uh, talking in the last uh, block of our session to Eric Weaver. He's from the Iowa State University, and he will talk about uh, sampling and interpolation of cumulative distribution functions of Cantor set in the zero one interval. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Carlos, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, so you see, I have some, some collaborators on this project, and I'll uh, mention more about them here in just a moment. But what you'll see on the screen, I think, is probably uh, pictures that are very familiar to all of you. On the, on the lower left part of the screen, you see the typical middle third canner set that we, we, we uh, depict in this way by removing intervals. And then on the lower right, we have uh, the cantor lebesgue function, or what some people like to call devil's staircase. And this is, this is the cumulative distribution function of the middle third canter set. So these, these are the two pictures to really have in mind uh, as we, as we uh, talk today. So this was a project uh, that I led a research experience for undergraduates in two years ago, summer of 2019. Uh, we had three undergraduate students. Uh, Allison Byers is now a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. Sarah McCarty is now a, a graduate student here at Iowa State. And Keith Sullivan, who I'm, I, I don't know where he ended up. And then we've had a couple grad ment graduate mentors involved in the project. Evan Kamrud is still a, a student here. And Nate Harding is now graduated and is at the University of South Dakota. So we were able to get a publication out of this project and that's the DOI. So if you wanna check out the paper, you can just type that into Google and, and you'll end up getting uh, the paper. It was published in Demonstratio Mathematica. Okay, so canter sets can mean a lot of different things. So let me define what I mean by a canter set. So a canter set is uh, created as, as depicted on that first screen by removing equally sized subintervals or, or equally scaled subintervals, I should say. And so these are defined by two objects. One is the scaling factor and the other is the digit set. So, so uh, if you wanna think about this in terms of uh, N area expansions, we, we define a base N and we define which, which um, digits were allowed to use in the n area expansions. Another description for us is just simply a binary vector. So we have a vector of length n, so n, the length of the vector, the number of components of the vector is the scale. And then we have either zeros or ones depending on which of the digits we're, we're keeping. Now in this talk, I won't use that binary vector notation much, but in our paper, we use it an awful lot. And it's particularly nice because it allows you to do things like take products of canter sets. You can take products of tensor products of binary vectors, and that gives you this type of operation on canter sets. Okay, so just a picture um, illustrating the idea. The first one again is what we've all seen before. The second one is not terribly surprising that for those who have thought about it, but, but here's just another way of thinking about a canter set, um, maybe without base three. So in this case, it'd be base four. We're keeping the, the digits corresponding to zero, one, and three. And this is the type of picture that we would get. And now I want to define a uh, cumulative distribution function. Oh, I'm sorry. I should say before I get to that, uh, there's a couple of particular ones that we, we, we just throw out as what we call degenerate. So if you don't keep any digits, there's nothing, right? So we don't allow that possibility. If we keep all the digits, then we just get um, the interval zero, one, and the corresponding measure is Lebesgue measure. So, so we, we put that aside as a special case. And for us, if you only keep one digit, that's uh, you end up with a canter set that's just a singleton and, and the corresponding cumulative distribution function also is just a Dirac mass, or I mean, I mean the measures of Dirac mass. So we, we, we do not consider those three special cases. So those are thrown out, but otherwise uh, we wanna think about all possible scales and all possible digit sets. Now, the way I think about these cumulative distribution functions is through the corresponding iterated function system. So we can define 
an iterated function system based on the scale n and based on the digits uh, that we keep. So that gives us uh, these uh, contractions and a theorem of Hutchinson uh, tells us that there is an invariant measure that is supported on the corresponding set. So the set I'll denote by C sub N D and the invariant measure I'll denote by mu sub N D. And uh, this invariant measure is supported on the Cantor set satisfies this invariant uh, invariance condition. And then the cumulative distribution function is really the cumulative distribution function of the measure. So um, nothing terribly surprising. Uh, if you, oops, I guess I can't quite highlight the screen, but um, but if you've seen if you've seen these measures before, this this is uh, not surprising. Now, I was working with undergraduate students, so I couldn't really throw this at them. So well, here's a picture that you you would get in this case base five, keeping uh, digits zero, one, and three. So these are our objects of study. Now, I couldn't just throw that definition from Hutchinson uh, at the students. So actually we approached it slightly differently. If you take a scale, you know, say the first approximation of the middle third, you can define what I would call a cumulative distribution function of that. You scale down to the next one, you refine uh, the cumulative distribution function and then the CDF for the corresponding measure is actually a uniform limit of these approximations. And this gave the, gave, gave the students something really concrete to get their hands on, right? These, these are easy to visualize, they're easy to construct. You can um, go as far off in, into the approximation as you want. And one other thing this does is this points out actually that um, these graphs themselves have some self-similarity, right? So. Uh, in this lower right corner here, if you take the whole thing and scale by one third in the horizontal direction and one half mm -hmm. in the vertical direction, you get the first part of it. And then if you take that and you shift it over and shift it up, you get the second part and then you just connect the dots from that point, right? So, so actually the students use that property in a couple of places in their project, this, this fact that this graph has that type of self-similarity. And Eric, sorry, the question just for clarification. What does it mean, point one one again? What does it mean? I'm sorry. Yeah. What is that on the x-axis? You have, we have the division. We have the partition on the y-axis. What does it represent again? What does the y-axis represent? The y-axis is um, so the zero one, and that's just the value of the the function between zero and one. Okay, thank there's, you. There's no, there's no real division here. Right? So, stop. Yeah, for us, there's the, the divisions on the y-axis aren't aren't as crucial, just the x-axis. Okay, so um, now as a as I as the title mentions, I want to think about sampling and interpolation. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to use a definition that uh, I got from Akram Aldrubi, which says the following. So if you have a set of functions with some common domain D, we'll say a subset of the domain is a set of uniqueness. If for any pair of functions in your set, if they agree on the smaller set S, then they actually agree everywhere. So this is what we call a set of uniqueness. V normally is a vector space of functions in, in our context, but actually for us, that's not true. We won't have a vector space, uh, just a set of functions. Now, for example, we, uh, I think a lot of us are familiar with these uh, particular examples, but here's two just to motivate the idea. If you take the set of all polynomials of degree at most n on R, then any n plus one unique points is a set of uniqueness, right? If you know a degree n polynomial at n plus one points, you know what the polynomial is everywhere. Uh, for example, if you look at the paley wiener space of uh, exponential type pi, then any subset of the real line with uh, lower borrowing density greater than one, that's a set of uniqueness. So if you know it at those points, you know it everywhere, in principle anyway. Okay, so 
our, our objects of study are all of these cumulative distribution functions. So let me just throw all those into a set G. So I look at all possible scales uh, greater than or equal to three, anything below that is degenerate. And I look at all possible choices of digit sets again, up to non-degeneracy. And the question is, can we, can we sample this uh, collection of functions? And to, to be more concrete about it, what if I take a specific subset of all of these CDFs? When is a subset of the inter interval a set of uniqueness for that collection of CDFs? So here's two specific examples that, that the students considered. What if we fix the scale? So we know the scale, we fix N, and we, the only thing that we don't know is the digit sets that's kept. So let me denote the collection of all CDFs with the same scale as H sub N. Another thing is suppose I don't know exactly the scale, but I know an upper bound on it. So let's say we fix a K and then I look at all cumulative distribution functions whose scale is less than or equal to K. And then the digit set is uh, any possible thing up to again, degeneracy. So one question to ask is uh, how small can a set of, sam set of uniqueness be for either of these two cases? And it'd be nice if we could characterize all of them. That was not something that we, that we got to, but we, we really looked pretty hard at the first question. How small can a set of sampling be, a set of uniqueness be for these uh, two special classes of CDFs? Okay, well, to, to put this into some context, what if we try to sample all CDFs all at the same time? Well, uh, it's pretty easy to see that this isn't gonna work very well if you try to only sample at finitely many points. If you give me any finitely many points um, in, the, in, in the X axis, and if you, even if you specify values on the Y axis, as long as they're increasing, I can find multiple CDFs that actually interpolate those data points. Uh, so what this means is on all of all, the set of all CDFs, I'm gonna need an infinite set of points. I don't know what, what uh, characterization of that might be, but you could do something very simple. You could just take all the rationals. And because these are all continuous functions, once you know their values and all the rationals, you know what their values are everywhere. And so that would be a set of uniqueness for all of G, but that in my mind, that's kind of cheating, right? So sampling at all the rationals is against the spirit of what sampling theory is all about, right? So that's why I call this rigging the game. Okay, well, let's consider something uh, maybe simpler, but also interesting. So if we fix the scale, so, we're, so we know what the scale is, we, the thing we don't know is the, um, digit set, well, we have n minus one points that would form a set of uniqueness. You just take all of the um, integer lattice points with, uh, with scale n. You don't need the two n points, right? Because zero has value zero and one has value one by the definition of a CDF. So you already know those points. You just need the points in the middle. Now we actually conjectured as a group, we conjectured that you should be able to sample, if you're clever, you should be able to sample on uh, n over two points. Now we have some support for that. This is, this is a conjecture, that might be a strong word because we don't have strong evidence, but some small evidence to indicate this. First off, if you sample at less than half of n, you definitely do not get a set of uniqueness. So if you have strictly less than n over two points, then you definitely do not have a set of uniqueness. And then we actually proved something kind of interesting, which is uh, we actually came up with what we would call a conditional sampling procedure with uh, n over two points. So what that means is we sample a couple points, we look at the values we get out and that determines where we pick the next sample point to be. And every time we wanna pick the next sample point, it actually depends on what the values we're getting from the previous sample points. So that's why we call it conditional, right? So we're not fixing the sample points a priori, we're actually choosing the sample points in some sense dependent on the signal itself. 
So we actually were able to construct such a conditional sampling procedure with uh, n over two points. So this seems to give some semblance that uh, n over two might be a, a good conjecture. But again, we don't know. We, this is this is open. All right. So that was the extent of um, what we were able to do when we knew exactly the the um, scale. So the second collection of uh, CDFs is when we don't know the exactly the scale, but we have an upper bound on the scale. So again, we denote this set by J sub K. So K is fixed. So K, we know K, we know the upper bound on the scale, but we don't know the scale or the digit set. And what we're able to prove is that uh, we could come up with a set of uniqueness that had size k cubed. Um, and, and this is a <clears throat> fairly interesting construction. Um, so let me, let me tell you about um, how we came up with this. So here's, here's the recipe that tells us how to construct this uh, set of uniqueness. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take every canner set whose scale is less than this upper bound K, again, I know K, and digit set whose size is two. So I construct all of these canner sets. I pick an irrational out of that canner set that is normal to all other bases that are not uh, dependent with them. So I'll explain my terms here uh, uh, in just a moment, but, but I have, I have a collection of canner sets, um, a special collection of canner sets that I'm gonna pick an irrational function, uh, irrational point out of that has other properties. And this process results in about K cubed points. Now that's not enough. The next thing I do is I look at all of the scales up to K, I look at, um, <clears throat> I look at their squares and I sample at uh, the lattice points uh, at those squares. And this yields also um, K, about K cubed points. And then I take the union of those two sets. All right, so let me, let me talk quite a bit about that first bullet point, define the terms and, and see how we arrived at this, uh, this, this method. Okay, so, so what do I mean by um, dependent if I can raise them and get the same number, right? So three, three cubed and 27 squared is, is the example I like to give, right? Because they both end up being three to the sixth, right? So three and 27, uh, um, are not dependent. Now that's kind of cheating because they're actually, uh, one is a power of the other one, but, but that's, uh, that, that, that idea is, is, the, uh, is what's going on here. And then a normal number with respect to a fixed base M, a normal number has a property that when you calculate its expansion in base M, all finite sequences of digits appear equally often. So this is, I think, well studied in number theory. Um, this was actually kind of new to me when, when my students started digging into this, um, but this is their definition of a normal number. And um, the reason why uh, these normal numbers are particularly useful for us is because if we have some, uh, if we have a cumulative distribution function and we sample at uh, a point that's in, um, inside of the corresponding canner set, then the value of the cumulative distribution function is irrational. So the idea is if, if I have an, if I have one of these points that I've picked out of uh, a specific canner set that's irrational and normal with respect to all of the other bases that are independent from that base, and I evaluate its, its um, 
cumulative distribution function. If it's rational, I don't get much information, but if it's irrational, I know that that point is actually in the underlying canner set. And so that means I actually get information about the scale. It doesn't uniquely determine the scale, but I get information about the scale and I get information about the digits. So if I have an unknown cumulative distribution function and I sample at all of these points that I've selected, whichever ones are irrational, that's going to tell me the scale up to this uh, algebraic dependency. So that's the idea behind this. Uh, let me back up here. So the first, first bullet point, the reason why we picked these points is because we can, if we have an unknown uh, cumulative distribution function, I can determine by, by evaluating the cumulative distribution function at those points, I can get the scale up to uh, algebraic dependence and I can actually get some information about which digits are actually in the underlying Cantor set. And then once I've narrowed down by a vast amount what the possible scale and what the possible digit sets are, that's where the second set comes in. Um, it comes in because of this proposition that says, if I have uh, cumulative distribution functions for powers of the same scale, and if they agree at every point in this particular set S, then they actually agree everywhere. So it's sort of a two-step process. If I like want to reconstruct the cumulative distribution function, I sample at these uh, point, these irrational points that I picked in the first set that narrows down the scale and the digits. I sample at uh, the second set of points that's gonna uniquely determine the scale up to uh, dependence and then it's gonna tell me exactly which digits uh, are in the underlying Cantor set. Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, we actually did, this, this was actually motivated by a question I asked the students. I said, what happens if you sample at random points, right? Early on in the project, right, they were sampling at these rational numbers um, and you, that only gets you so far. And I said, well, what if you start sampling at random points? What would random actually get you? And interestingly enough, that inspired them to think about these special irrational points inside of these canter sets. And in fact, uh, what, what it turns out to be is that uh, if we want to pick these XMDs, we actually can pick them randomly with respect to the invariant measure. So if you fix the scale uh, N and you fix the digit set D, then with respect to its, its invariant measure, almost all points inside of it are normal to every base uh, that, are, that are algebraically independent from the scale. And of course, the rationals are a set of measure zero in there as well. So if you pick, if you pick a point at random out of each one of these canter sets with respect, and by random, I mean with respect to its invariant measure, we're gonna get exactly the points that we want. Um, and, and the proof, this theorem actually goes back, uh, I think at least to Castles. Uh, that's where uh, I didn't actually do any of this digging. The students did this digging into, into this idea. Um, so they read the papers. Uh, the paper by uh, Wolfgang Schmidt is actually in German. So they did a lot of translating from German while they were at it. Uh, and then we actually went through the whole process of reproving this, this result, just so we, un we knew that we understood what we were doing because none of us are number theorists, to be honest. Um, but uh, the proof is actually a lot of Fourier analysis, which, uh, which is uh, fascinating to me. All right, so uh, I can tell you a little bit more about that if there's time. Um, actually, uh, that's, that's what I give here. Let, let me skip a little bit ahead and I can come back to that uh, if there's interest. Um, well, actually I do have a couple minutes. So let me, excuse me, let me, oops. Let me say a few words. Okay, so uh, these are not our results. Um, this is results that we 
gathered from the Castles paper, from uh, the Wolfgang Schmidt paper. Um, we needed a couple estimates on exponential sums and trigonometric functions, or at least that, that was developed by Castles. Um, so we needed a couple of those. Um, and then we need, we need this, uh, this estimate on this exponential sum. And that was really actually, I think the hardest part of, of the proof that, that we reconstructed was um, um, coming up with this type of uh, estimate on exponential sums. And then using these, uh, these exponential sums, these estimates on these exponential sums, we can use uh, Viles criterion on uh, normal numbers, um, uh, use these, uh, these estimates uh, to actually show that, that almost every point satisfies uh, Viles criterion, and then you get the normalcy of, of the number. So what I was most impressed by is we're talking about undergraduate students that, I mean, not only were they dealing with all these new ideas, but they were digging into the literature from 50 years ago, some of it in German, and they didn't let the, the measure theory stop them. They just, they just dove right in with the measure theory and they, they did really well on that. So um, I was very happy, very pleased with that. Okay, so uh, with that, I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Eric for the nice talk. Uh, so we have uh, time for some a few questions. If somebody have comments, so this is hi Emily. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, this was like the key to everything that was going on. But I, I saw the definition of, of normal, but it, it it didn't quite click in. Like, what do you have? Normal, maybe an example. A number? Of, yeah, right here. All fine. So this is a lot stronger than we need, right? All, all we really want is to know that the point we pick out of one canner set isn't in any canner set with a different scale, which means we just need to know what it has all of the digits. Mm -hmm. So a normal number has all of the digits, but it also has all pairs of digits that, that appear in the, with the same frequency. And it has all three sequences of digits that appear with the so same. So if it was like to base two, then it has like a zero and a one. Well, that's obvious, but With then it has a zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one in the expansion and then so on and so forth. Yeah, with equal okay. frequency. Uh, I just wanted to comment exactly on this part because uh, you mentioned the uh, theorem of Hutchinson, right? And this is exactly if you have the invariant measure associated to the P equal one half, one half, so equal weights for each interval you choose, then you can prove actually that the measure you get out of it is, has essential support on the normal numbers. Whereas if you choose P and one minus P, the essential support is on the sequences of zeros and ones who have P with probability and uh, one with probability of one third, third and zero with probability of two thirds, for example. I mean, just, so the, the essential support is disjoint, even though they are all supported on the same counter set. Yeah. So this is just a comment. Okay. Um, so I have a, a small question. Um, Eric, any chance to, to extend some of these results to a more general control sets? Well, I mean, I can imagine at least half a dozen ways of directions of extending uh -huh. this. I mean, we this is what we did during that one summer. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> okay. Now, you know, like I said, canter sets can mean lots of different things. So, so we have to define our terms, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, th there could be a lot of different ways of doing this, including, um, you know, in an earlier talk, uh, I think on Thursday, 
it was talk about canter sets with overlap, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you allow overlap, then then I think this could be a, a very different problem from this mm -hmm. one. Okay. Or if you allow, like uh, like Ursula just mentioned, if you start weighting these things, so the measures now look mm -hmm. quite a bit different. Now you've got a lot more complexity to deal with. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I was just thinking in in contrast with the uh, the gaps, the different size, or not proportional to. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. You could. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I, I found the nice thing, I guess Maybe one yeah. thing to say. The nice thing about this. Yeah. At least that made this accessible to the undergraduate students is the number of parameters is small and the number of total combinations is is you know once you fix the scale or bound the scale it's it's finite right if you start allowing something like weights <laughs> and you allow any any p and one minus p right it's just not it's not just adding two more you know another parameter but now you don't okay. even have, now it's harder to define even just a finite collection of CDFs that you're trying to sample. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, actually, I, I found very nice this idea of uh, using the samples that you already have to predict where to sample uh, next. I think it could be very, very interesting. I never, I never uh, uh, saw this uh, in, in, in another context. Yeah. That, that, yeah, and this is the first place that I've really done that myself, but, you know, it wasn't my idea. I, I got the idea from somewhere else. I know in, in a number of other contexts, that's actually a, okay. a, a common way of thinking about it. Okay, let's uh, thank Eric again for this nice talk. Thank you. Okay, so...